is Daniel Cunningham. I'm a horticulturist with Rooted In, a company that is focused on environmental education and marketing, as well as landscape design and plant selection. And we are thrilled to be able to join you this morning uh, because of the hard work of the folks at Save Dallas Water, a program with Dallas Water Utilities, which is focused on uh, water conservation and stormwater education. They have a fantastic website where you can sign up for more classes like this one, which is savedallaswater.com. You can see in the middle of the screen, uh, they have their upcoming events as well as the watering schedule. Um, if you are a city of Dallas resident and you're wondering when the right time to water is, you can find that information there. Also, just a note that we have a 70 to 80 percent chance of rain for the next week or so, so probably aren't going to need to water anytime soon, which is great news. Now, if you are interested in learning more about when and how much uh, to water, you can visit the website waterisawesome.com, which is sponsored by our friends at Dallas Water Utilities. Um, and on that website, if you go down, you will see some information on landscape water use, tips for plant selection, uh, all different types of ways that you can save water in your landscape, as well as information on weekly watering advice. And so if you click on that, you can pick from the two different options there. And basically you just go and enter in your address and then it will tell you based on local weather station data and how much rainfall we've seen recently, uh, the amount of water that our plants typically need, how much and how long you need to water. Now you can sign up to have that information sent to you via cell phone or your email address, whatever your preference is. And I'm signed up myself personally, and I can attest that if you give them your cell phone number or your email, they don't send you any spam just once a week advice of when to water or when to wait. So again, that is waterisawesome.com. Now, water conservation and, and growing healthy, vibrant landscapes really go hand in hand. And there are a lot of benefits uh, in addition to that. A healthy landscape can help increase your home's value. It can reduce utility bills like a watering bill during the summer. It can help clean and filter air and locally, control flooding and erosion. And these are problems that we will probably see over the next week with excessive rainfall predicted. Now, if we're getting started uh, to kind of uh, give our landscape a facelift, and that was one thing I was doing this morning, I got started shoveling some decomposed granite, uh, but we wanna spend some time on the design element first, especially when we are talking about native landscapes. Sometimes native landscapes get a bad rap of being too wild and unkept, but we can really use design tools uh, to help keep them, whether you want a more natural look or a manicured look, look to where they're intentional and they fit in with your surrounding community. Now, part of that is plant selection, and, and we'll talk about some specific plants this morning, some of my favorite natives, but making sure that we select the right plant for the right place. We also want to come up with an irrigation plan. There are some plants that after they're established, they require very little water at all. But during the summer months, if we're in a drought, we want to make sure that we can deliver water to, to protect our investment, whether that is through drip irrigation or overhead spray irrigation. Uh, perhaps it's simply just watering with the hose when we need to. Then you'll also want to spend some time installing hardscape. And a hardscape is basically all the materials in a landscape that aren't plant material. So this could be pathways and patios and finches and edgings and fountains and, and what have you, um, but really are, are kind of the backbone elements before we put the plants in the ground. Then, unfortunately, in our area, we have challenging soil. Most of us are dealing with heavy clays here in Dallas County. And so soil preparation to add compost and help break up those clays is also important, even with some of our native plant material. And sometimes, especially some of our drought tolerant plant material, we want to make sure that they have good drainage. So 
we do get wet weather, they, their roots don't tend to rot out or, or have any issues there. And then at that point, we actually, it's time to install the plants and probably the most fun part of, of gardening to actually see that transformation, um, the plants in the ground and begin to grow. We do want to make sure that, again, we protect that investment by mulching. Mulching will reduce the weeds that pop up. It will help more water infiltrate when we do get rainfall events. And then it will uh, hold on to that water during the drought periods, the periods without water that we know we're going to see each summer. And then we want to make sure that we do have uh, a watering schedule set if we're uh, following our twice a week watering, just making sure that we're not over watering our plants when we're getting significant rainfall and we are watering them when we see those periods where we go a week or 10 days without irrigation, perhaps especially during the establishment of our plants, we want to make sure that we are watering them to keep them alive. Well, today we're going to focus on the first two items there, which are design and plant selection. Now, there are definitely some challenges to growing plants in Texas. We all have experienced heat and extreme cool this year. Sunlight, the right amount, you know, the quantity as well as the quality of the sunlight and make sure that we're planting plants in those areas where we can set ourselves up for success. I mentioned weeds. They compete with our plants for water and sunlight and nutrients, so we want to keep those at a minimal and then other pest and disease problems. Now, one of the benefits of selecting natives is because they've evolved in our sometimes harsh and unpredictable climate. Uh, they've evolved with different diseases and pests that we naturally would see in this area. They tend to be more resilient and resistant, as well as lower water users are better adapted to our rainfall regime, which is about 36 inches or so of year we get on average. Uh, some years we can get more than that, up to 60 inches. Some years we only get you know, as much as 18 inches. But that's really what we're trying to do is use native plants to overcome these challenges in the landscape. Now, we do get most of our water where we're watering our plants from, from our local water bodies. And it's important to protect that natural resource because, you know, going back uh, throughout the history of Dallas, we look back, um, you know, the past hundred years, we see significant drought periods. And if we kind of know that we're going to see more droughts in the future, especially with a rapidly growing population, that's going to put a stress on our water supplies that not only do we use for watering you know, our outdoor landscapes, but also for taking a shower, for um, you know, washing dishes, all the things that we need water for. So if we can save the water for the stuff that is more important, and I think it's water is very important for landscapes, but for drinking and for, for hygiene and all that stuff, for flushing the toilet, then we can do more with less in the landscape and we'll have room for future growth in Texas. And really that's significant. Our estimates are 51 to 54 million people will be in the state of Texas over the next 50 years. And, and really in, in terms of conservation, but also in terms of stormwater, that really impacts our water cycle. If we think about what Dallas and, and North Central Texas looked like 100 years ago, if we had a rainfall event like we're expecting tomorrow, 50% uh, of that water would actually infiltrate into the ground. Now, now we have a city and driveways and sidewalks and rooftops and, and all these things, roads and parking lots. Now, where do those raindrops go? Only about 15% of them actually infiltrate into the ground in 55% are runoff. Well, what does this have to do with native plants? Well, native plants really do a great job of planted in the right way of infiltrating that water and reducing our flooding problems and some of that erosion uh, that is tied in and in, in with, uh, with flooding. It also, if we can slow spread and sink the water in our landscapes, uh, we can reduce the runoff, which has harmful fertilizers and pesticides and different pathogens 
that we don't want to end up in our creeks and our water bodies. And then because our water in those lakes are expected to decline over the next 50 years by 11 percent, um, we really want to make sure that we are drought proofing our landscape with a method that I like to call landscape CPR and native plants fit really well with that conservation we've talked about. We're talking about conserving not only water, but also soil, energy, and air quality. And we can preserve and enhance the habitat and ecological functions of our area, our, our local landscapes as kind of a starting point. As much as possible, we want to disconnect those impermeable surfaces like the rooftops and the driveways and the sidewalk. So we're not just sending water down to contribute to flooding problems, we want to infiltrate that water so our plant root zone can use it and let it slow and spread sink out into the ground. Now, one of the ways we can do that is be by creating soil that is biologically active and will hold on to that water. We love rainwater harvesting. In fact, we have a rainwater harvesting class uh, that we're partnering up with Dallas Water Utilities that you can find on their website or our website, rootedin.com. Uh, where you'll learn the ins and outs of harvesting water in a rain barrel. But really, harvesting water in a rain barrel, as, as essential as it is, um, we can hold a lot more water in the soil if we are adding compost and mulch and planting with the right native plants. So if we're doing that right, the R in CPR is retention. We want to capture that water, allow it to sink, eliminate the runoff problems that we have, in those pollutants that we've already addressed. Now, one way we can do that is designing native landscapes that are about a third turf grass. So we like to use the rule of thirds. So you may like a lawn where you can let the dog use the restroom or maybe your kids or grandkids play, uh, entertain people. But we really don't need as much turf grass as you would see in a typical neighborhood in Dallas. We would really prefer that we extend the beds wider um, and plant about a third a native and adapted perennials throughout that landscape. Not only are they going to allow the water infiltrate more, they're also more low maintenance, tend to have less pest and disease problems than turf grass. So you're really getting a, a more bang for your buck. And then in between there, you can have pathways and patios and different hardscape features that instead of being impervious like concrete, can actually allow the water to sink in. We can see some of this black gravel pathways they are very in vogue here. Different rocks that add different colors and accents and borders for our native plants. And so that may be something that you want to consider as well. Uh, pervious hardscapes also work really well in shaded areas where you may not get grass to grow. And so if you're planting that hardscape, it's somewhere that you can sit and enjoy uh, that shade, especially during the summer months. And then again, as that, that hardscape infiltrates water, it could be, you know, paved stones or limestone or, you know, any type of flagstone gravel. It's going to slow and spread and sink the water to the plant's advantage. Now, unfortunately, when we talk about native and adaptive landscapes, people think this is the type of plant material that we're talking about with just this, all these rocks everywhere and, and dominating the landscape with cacti and, and yucca. And, and although those landscapes have their place in really arid areas, because we get 36 inches of rainfall, this really shouldn't be the dominant landscape feature that we see. Now, a lot of people like rock gardens and cacti gardens, and, and if that is your interest, certainly you should, you should try that. But really the challenge to do that here is that we wanna make sure we do have good drainage uh, for those drought tolerant plants to succeed. What we want to do is show people that there are other options, however, that you can create lush and vibrant landscapes with a variety of plant material that are native with different colors and textures um, that not only are they water efficient and low maintenance, but they look fantastic too. You don't have to have one or the other, a native landscape or an ornamental landscape. You can actually have any of those features that you desire if you start with a design and you implement that uh, with the best practices. Now, native plants are hardy, they're from Texas. So like I said, they've evolved and are sometimes harsh and unpredictable uh, uh, climate. They're also adapted to the heavy clay soils that tend to be more alkaline. If you're not familiar with the term alkaline, it just means it's a higher pH. 
Some of the soils in East Texas are acidic with lower pH that are better adapted for azaleas and magnolias and some of the other plants that, that are more indigenous there. It's better to plant plants in our area that can actually withstand of that higher pH. Now, I mentioned extreme weather. You know, we're just coming off at one of the, the most extreme weather events that we've seen with the freeze in February. So as much as possible, we want to make sure that the plants we're putting in the ground, a plant adapted to or native to Texas may not be at home in every part of Texas. So a plant native to El Paso may not do a great job in Dallas or a plant native to uh, Laredo or, or Houston or Orange may not do as well in Dallas. And so we want to make sure that native plants are regionally adapted to our extreme weather and climate. One of the other benefits of native plants that I really enjoy is most of them provide food and shelter for native bees and butterflies and birds and other mammals. So as you plant with natives, you're kind of restoring the ecosystem uh, that we would naturally see in our area. And if, if none of that stuff floats your boat, really the biggest benefit is it can help you save time and money by choosing natives, uh, which is something that, that I'm very excited about. Well, I mentioned our website, rootedin.com, and, and I would invite you to open it up in, a, in another browser now if you'd like. If you go to on the front page, the landing page there, just down, uh, just scroll down a bit, you'll find our blog entries. And the latest blog entry is our new top 100 plants for North Texas. Now, out of those 100 plants, about 75 of them are native plants, native shrubs and woody perennials, herbaceous perennials. We have vines and ground covers. And you can actually search as you go through it's a PDF file, so you can search native, and you'll see all of the plants uh, that are actually native to our area. And then we also have well-adapted plants that are indigenous to, to other parts of the world. Now, along with plant selection, we want to make sure that we're selecting the natives that are adapted to our macro environment. And that's really our region, north central Texas, we want to make sure that, that plants are adapted to our rainfall, our droughts, and, and the different weather extremes that we see. We're in hardiness zone 8A, which means on average we get down to about 10 to 15 degrees is the lowest temperature we see. That's that 30-year average anyway. We just saw negative 2 and negative 3 and 4, depending on where you are in the metroplex. And so you may want to think, you know, hey, I lost some plant material I want to make sure that I'm planting plants that are a little bit uh, adaptable to a little bit colder than zone 8A, so maybe 7B. But I like to have, you know, three-fourths and 90% of the plants in my landscape that are cold hardy to, to the most extreme weather events that we'll get, whether that's hot or cold, what have you. Um, and you'll notice that most of the native plants uh, in our landscape really came back quite well, even out of that really cold uh, weather event. We also, part of our macro environment is a soil type, heavy clays and pH that I talked about. Our water rainfall patterns are also key. But the micro environment is also important. And the micro environment is our environment at like a street level or the side of town you're on, maybe even the side of the house that you're trying to plant in. How much sunlight or shade is in that area? How do the buildings and structures affect that shade? You know, uh, if you're trying to plant a shade garden underneath some trees, it's going to get some dappled sunlight coming through there. But if you're that part of the landscape is shaded by a house or a fence or a, you know maybe your neighbor's house or shed, there's not any sunlight that can shine through buildings. So that's that's what we're referring to in terms of the quality of light. Also. Um, you know, structures can affect how much water goes in an area. If it doesn't have gutters and it runs off, the pavement can affect uh, the heat island effect. And so you, that may be a detriment. You may have to s select certain plants if you're growing between a driveway and a sidewalk that are more heat and drought tolerant. Or you could use that to your advantage. There's a plant that I really love called Blackfoot Daisy, and you try and move that in in a typical landscape that has clay soil and is mulchal heavy, and if it's got any kind of shade or extra moisture, they're really not happy. 
But what they love is like growing on the side of a driveway in those heat island spaces that have good drainage. Um, so you can use those to your advantage. There's also parts of our landscape that get a little bit more irrigation or they're slower to drain, a little bit less irrigation. So making sure we tailor the right plant for the right place uh, with soil moisture is, is also important. I wanted to kind of just talk about design principles because I think when we're planting native plants, a lot of times, um, unfortunately, sometimes they get the connotation that the native plants are wild and they kind of grow in 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 an unkept manner. And what we're going to show people, you can design landscapes that are more natural and kind of flowing and, and using the right plant material that are really ornamental and striking that your neighbors and your neighborhood and your friends and your family can be proud of. We can do it in a way where it really is ornamentally pleasing. Or if you like a style that is more formal, more of an English style garden, you can achieve that same look with native plants as well. So I'm going to go through this quickly. I, I promise, though, that we have other classes um, where we dig deeper into landscape design principles. But I do think that it's important to, to introduce these in this program as well. So unity is one of those. It helps organize um, at different themes of a garden into kind of clean and orderly groups. And we can kind of emphasize whether it's you know the hardscape materials we use, the different garden elements. What we don't want to see is elements of an English garden and maybe a Japanese garden and a cottage garden all together, modern elements and traditional elements, they don't really fit. And so as much as possible, if you can design a theme where everything fits together, it tends to look like it's more intentional. Um, and th people struggle with native plants with that sometimes. Lines are also important, which kind of connect and define different spaces. We think just like a home inside has rooms with walls that define spaces, we can use pathways and different plant materials to help design different rooms. And, and they can kind of take you through the pathways, can take you to different elements of a landscape and make you want, maybe you want to walk to a sitting area or an area with a bird feeder where you could watch birds or maybe maybe it's a pathway that's functional that takes you to the front yard or the backyard or to take out a, the trash but line can help uh, define different spaces they can also slow you down we have this water feature in the center and it's kind of where four pathways meet it's an area where you can sit and listen to the water but also when you have multiple paths splitting up splitting off it's kind of a choose your own adventure do you want to go in this direction or that direction and, and that is pleasing um, there's also, you know, more modern looks with different lines and pathways, and this is a more of a modular-like look that I'm doing in my own backyard, but it really does work well with native plants, uh, where sometimes you may have native plants that look like they're kind of spilling out of the landscape, but if you have cleaner lines, it kind of makes that landscape look more intentional and, and more uh, kept. You can also uh, achieve lines uh, with the plant material themselves. This is a lot of hedging and I'm not recommending boxwoods, um, but if you wanted to and you like that type of look, you could certainly achieve that with yopon hollies and other native plants um, if, if you so choose. Now form is something else to think about. If we're looking at this picture, you'll see that each plant has a different shape. These are all evergreen conifers, slightly different colors, but each one, one has like a columnar shape. It kind of looks like uh, you know, straight up and down like a column. There's more oval shaped plants that naturally would tend to grow in, in kind of a wider round shape. There's vase shaped plants which tend to be skinnier at the bottom and wider at the top. Plants that have more weeping form and pyramidal form and round form. And if you contrast those different forms in the landscape, you can really be intentional at making each plant stand out. Now, texture is also important, and it's something that you can achieve with plant material that has leaves that are either fine or coarse or heavy or light, um, plants that are either thin or dense, or plants that are either light and shade in, in terms of um, kind of the shadows that they cast. This is using two different native plants and a combination of texture that I really like, and this agave is called green goblet agave it's uh native agave has really nice kind of a wide leaf excuse me 
wide leaves and kind of undulating uh, spines. And then the difference, uh, if these were just all planted in a mass planting, they would kind of just merge together and you wouldn't notice the intricacies of those beautiful leaves. But we have Mexican feather grass too, which has a very airy, open, fine texture. And planting those two things together, each one of them tends to jump off the screen, right? Or they'll jump off your garden. So anytime you can contrast the textures, really you get more of an impact and more of a wow factor uh, like we see with these examples. And you can achieve that in shady spots or sunny spots or any type of landscape area that you like. Scale is also something important. Um, initially, when you look at this picture, you may think, oh, this is a small little pot with a little succulent in it. But this is actually a huge pot that, that's probably, you know, with a huge agave in there that's about the size of a small human. And so, you know, we can really control with the depth of the planting. If we're planting purples, they tend to make um, the, the scale seem like it's further away. If we plant with oranges, it makes the scale feel like it's closer to us. We can plant gardens that are in smaller spaces and more intimate with a smaller scale, or we can plant gardens that are larger that kind of create an expanse that kind of wants to draw us out. Now, balance is also something to think about in landscape design. Uh, symmetry, whether it's the background or the foreground or to the left or the right side of your screen, making sure that the colors and the plantings are kind of balanced where they fit. You could be in, intentional with, with um, being unsymmetrical, um, or you could be intentional with making sure that the colors kind of are carried throughout the landscape uh, the hardscape, the different plantings are, are balanced out. And really that depends on the goals that you're trying to achieve. Now this landscape, we have a pathway on the left and, and heavy plantings on the right, a kind of a natural planting. But you can see this, the same plantings are repeated throughout the landscape. So those scales are, it's kind of even throughout this right side, but it draws you throughout. It's like, oh, I want to see Kind of what's next as it's repeated throughout and the same thing with this planting here it may not be the same colors of the plant material but there is some balance to the form and the function and the structure uh, that really kind of makes it like like enjoyable to walk down that path you can also use balance with the native plants like i talked about that are more kind of wild and undulating like these native grasses you may think that this is just kind of a too wild for, for maybe your front yard, but it's really nice in areas where you have a clean sidewalk and a clean driveway. Those clean lines define the space. And so if you do have kind of a more wild naturalistic planting, it makes that look more intentional and more capped and, and, uh, and, and maybe more pleasing to the eye. Now, simplicity and variety go hand in hand to balance each other. A lot of times native plant enthusiasts and myself included, I want to get one of these and one of these and one of these. And so my landscape is like a botanic garden with just a collection of plants. But really to, to simplify that and to maybe tone back on how many species you get and to try and do them uh, repeated through the landscape in different combinations, maybe throughout borders, um, look tend to look better and less hodgepodge. Now you still want to have some variety too, a variety of color color contrast and texture contrast. Um, and no matter if you're in a shady spot or a sunny spot, you can use native plants to achieve that. Now, color is also something, an, an element that does invoke the greatest response. Um, it can create mood and feeling. A lot of times landscapes like this one pictured that has purples and blues and grays, they tend to feel cooler even in the summer. And so it may be an area, maybe you want to have a, a spot where you can have shaded from the west sun, but you can sit and enjoy. It also tends to make landscapes feel like they're further away. So if you have a limited space to grow plants, you want to use purples and blues, it kind of makes that part of the landscape feel like it's deeper and bigger. And the opposite could be said for plants that have orange and yellow leaves. It tends to, if you had a huge expanse, you want to plant those colors, it kind of makes them feel more intimate. Uh, sometimes you can also get color combinations by 
um, by the leaves themselves. It's not just the flowers that provide color, but there's many native plants like this rising sun redbud that offer some great colors in the leaves too. And then other plants like this liatris, and we have some rudbeckia here that they may come up and bloom for different times of the year. Um, so they'll pop up and add a lot of color and then you know, maybe they add some structure as they die back and then something else pop, pops up. So you have kind of this crescendo of these uh, plants that are that are um, coming up and doing their thing. And then uh, they give other plants a time to shine. Now, one of the masters at, at doing those type of design, his name is Pete Aldolf. He's a Dutch gardener that is behind the new perennial movement. He's actually designed some gardens here in Texas and, and uses a lot of Texas native plants throughout the country. It's neat to see some of his designs in California and New York have some of my favorite uh, Texas natives. In fact, my wife and I, a couple of years ago, got to go to one of his designs uh, in New York. And I would say, you know, half of the plants I recognized as, as Texas natives. Um, this is one of Pete Aldolf's designs. He uses native plants a lot, not, not solely natives, but he kind of tries to create a, a wildflower meadow that really never exists in, in, in the wild. So uh, there's amazing, you know, blue bonnets and, and uh, paint brushes and, and uh, you know, prairie blankets and fire wheels and, uh, you know, sunflowers and all different types of, of, uh, of wildflowers that look amazing, um, but this is more choosing the right combinations and repeating them throughout the landscapes divided by pathways that are very kind of defined and intentional. And so it kind of keeps those wildflower meadows together, but also allows you to explore the different pathways that he's designed. He's also very intentional about using plant material that looks interesting year round. So this garden is in the time in the fall. This is a, a garden that's on an old, old train trellis um, in, in and around New York. And so um, at this point, there's a lot of native grasses that really add a contrast in their form and structure. They also add movement in terms of wind. They tend to be in the fall, like blonde and browns. And so you get some really interesting colors and, and texture combinations. Uh, and they also look amazing in the summer because they're natives that are drought tolerant. You get a lot of blooms throughout the summer months and probably you know, a lot of times when other people's landscapes are really struggling, this is when these landscapes are looking their best. And in the spring, they also look amazing as we get kind of a renewed sense of green and plants just starting to bloom and have different interests. Uh, I also love the way that this hardscape kind of melds into, into the plantings. It's like, it's not as a defined space, it's more like the, 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 the hardscape and the landscape just merge together. Uh, and then, again, a lot of the plants that, that people may be cutting back or deadheading, he actually leaves intentionally, not only for the benefits to different pollinators and wildlife, but so you can enjoy the structure of those seed heads and those grasses and those flowers that have dried down, which, you know, I think maybe we were initially trained that that looked weedy, but as we intentionally do that, we really can create this contrast of texture and form and structure that is inviting and more interesting. I will tell you that my neighbors that have landscapes that look more like this, I intentionally ride my bike and walk with, with, with my wife and family and I go on walk because those landscapes are interesting, something to look at. The ones with 90% St. Augustine grass are like, you know, there's just nothing to see here, move along. Now, you can do this type of design on a residential setting, and, and, and this is a look that I really like, different sages, salvias, and native grasses. Um, one great book or resource for that is called Planting in a Post-Wild World by Thomas Rainier, and you can see here he's got some, some uh, this is a native salvia uh, azura, there's also some Salvia nemorosa there, some lantana, some turks cap, um, rock rose. But really the theme is uh, creating kind of splashes and swaths of different plants uh, that are kind of planted a little bit close together with other plants that kind of fill in that space. Now, 
one way that he does that, uh, Thomas Rainier and Claudia Wests together, um, that they work for a landscape design firm, and they'll have kind of a structural layer. So we see like the Joe Pye weed on the top of the screen. There's kind of a smaller native uh, tree shrub on the right, and then throughout there he has seasonal theme layers. So you know the echinaceas come up in the spring and bloom until mm -hmm. the summer, and then about that same time, you know, as the summer fades into fall, we'll see the gay feather. They pop up and they kind of go down in different plants that are kind of got splashed throughout the landscape. That boom, they come up and and look amazing and you know, provide nectar for wildlife. And then those uh, flowers kind of die back and they provide seeds for birds. And then between there, he plants a ground cover layer. And the, the two pictures I showed before, that was Mexican feather grass. And so it really looks like those plantings are kind of, um, all the plants in there are, are even and distributed throughout. So it kind of carries your eye and has a nice flow to it. Uh, so he also uses those techniques for rain gardens and, and green infrastructure projects. A lot of times we'll see plantings there with a lot of mulch and plants kind of planted sparsely throughout there. And if it's an area that gets a lot of flooding, sometimes that mulch tends to run away. And so you had kind of a rain garden or a bioswale or one of those features, you could actually use this method to establish plants, native plants that have a fibrous root system that are going to hold on to that water, help sink it in there, control flooding problems, and reduce different erosion issues. So this is just a quote by Thomas Rainier from his book that I really, um, it resonates with me, but it says, over time with industrialization and urban sprawl, we've driven nature out of our natures in cities, but we can invite it back by designing landscapes that look and function more like they do in the wild that are robust, diverse, and visually harmonious. And, and, you know, you can do that with native and adapted plants and create these areas which really um, create inviting spaces for us to enjoy, but also tend to give back to wildlife. Now, speaking of wildlife, you may really like the ability of native plants to provide nectar or, or larval uh, host species um, for a variety of different uh, native bees and butterflies and hummingbirds and, and birds and, and you know, turtles and reptiles and whatever. And not only are these um, great uh, you know, elements that bring joy. They also bring function to our landscape, helping to pollinate and control different pest and insect problems. And so you may really want to, in addition to choosing flowers that look good and grasses and shrubs, some that also provide benefit to that wildlife as well. And, and really you can achieve this all together um, and creating kind of this harmonious or holistic landscape that not only gives back to the garden, but also to um, the wildlife that we like to see in the garden. Now, I mentioned hardscape before, and there's a lot of different elements of hardscape that really fit well with native plants. One of those uh, is arroyos or dry riverbeds. And I like that these are not only functional, that we can have them coming from our ground downspouts or gutters or maybe overflow from our cisterns. And these will direct the water, allow it to slow, spread, and sink into the landscape. And then if we interplant these, with native plant material, it will help kind of stabilize these dry riverbeds. Um, but then the native plants help to uh, dissipate some of that water, whether it's infiltrating more into the soil with the root zone or because the plants are using up the water, they help to uh, remove it out of um, that area so we don't have mosquito problems or flooding problems. Uh, you can also achieve that with just, you know, regular hardscape. So on the bottom left, we see uh, different flagstone pavers and decomposed granite. And so it, when the water drops hit those, instead of just causing flooding problems downstream, they actually work with the native plants around them to, to infiltrate that water and, and be useful. And when we're planting with natives or any plant for that material, we want to pay attention to layering. And so you'll see this picture. We have kind of taller plants at the back, medium sized plants kind of in the middle and then lower plants in the front. And if we're on kind of the right side of the screen and we're looking at that bed, we can see the different color and texture contrast through the planting. Uh, it's also important that we're planting 
plants with a mind of where the sun is actually coming from. Because we're in the northern hemisphere, the sun is kind of always on the southern part of our homes. Unless we have big mature trees on the south side, that's always going to be the sunniest spot. So if we have larger plants on the north side, then all the plants in front of those are going to get the sunlight, right? Like if the sun was over here, they, they may not be getting as much on the back side. Um, and so be intentional with that. Think about, okay, the sun's rising in the east, it's setting in the west, it's typically going to be on the south side-ish, you know, kind of um, the summer it's more overhead and the winter it's kind of more lower in the sky. But make sure that when you're planting larger shrubs and trees that you're not going to shade out the plant material you have existing or maybe you actually want to plant an ornamental tree to help provide shade for a plant that can be struggling because it's too hot on the west side. So look at that, be intentional with your native plants and, and making sure you're putting the right plant for the right place in, in terms of sunlight. With those plantings and that layering, look at the different forms or the shape of the overall plant, the texture, the leaf size and shape, the color of the leaves as well as the color of the blooms and perhaps what time of year they bloom. You may want to plant a plant that blooms heavy in the spring with another plant that blooms heavy in the fall. So there's interest there, to, you know, no matter what time of year you're enjoying that space. You should also pay attention to evergreen plants. So if I'm layering different native plants, I want to make sure at least somewhere, probably twice in that sequence, that I have an evergreen plant or a semi evergreen plant. So it's going to provide interest in October, November, December, January, February, you know, when we get freezing temperatures and those part of the landscapes could look a little bit more drab. So you may still have kind of blank spots from the freeze that happened before. You can remember back, oh, that is a blank space in, in kind of December, January. Maybe I want to focus on a native evergreen in that spot so that it provides year-round interest. And we'll talk about specific plants now that can fill that role. One of my favorite native ornamental trees is the red bud. Um, and I have quite a few of these planted in, in my landscape. They have one of the first <laughs> things to bloom in the spring. But a lot of the new improved red buds, now these aren't native to Texas. This is um, the uh, Circus canadensis, or um, it's the subspecies that's native to kind of the eastern part of America. Same genus and species, just the subspecies um, for this specific cultivar. But this one's called Rising Sun Redbud, and it does fantastic in uh, full sun to part shade, but provides just incredible blooms that that our wildlife can use, and then the foliage that is very colorful throughout the season with oranges and reds and yellows. Um, I have one of these outside my kitchen window, uh, and it's just amazing to look at. Now, there's other red buds in addition to our traditional natives like forest pansy, uh, Merlot, and Ruby Falls, which have that burgundy foliage. Again, these are North American natives or Texas natives or hybrids. Um, and they have those heart-shaped leaves. And if you give them full sun to part sun, you'll really see a lot more of those purples and, and Merlots. If you give them uh, more shade, they can grow in those conditions fairly well, but they don't tend to see as, as much color. There's also, also excuse me, a newer one called Vanilla Twist, uh, which has white blooms instead of the traditional pink blooms we see on red buds. Now, one plant that is a not native and it's not well adapted to our area is the Italian cypress, which has had a lot of dieback in recent years with different problems of fungus and, and freezing temperatures. Um, but there are a lot of natives uh, that, that really kind of work in those same spots that add vertical height as evergreens. These are all cultivars of our native uh, Rocky Mountain juniper, Juniper scopulorum. Um, this is a blue arrow on the left, which has a more upright form that gets 12 to 15 feet. You have kind of the gray-green foliage of gray-gray gleam. Um, and then we have the sky rocket, which only gets uh, three feet wide or so, but it gets up to 15 or to 20 feet tall. So if you're trying to fill a space on your house, like where you have maybe a two-story house and it's got a big blank space, or maybe you're wanting to do an evergreen screen to screen out some neighbors or some noise, um, all these, these plants do well in those areas. There's also some that have more of the Christmas tree shape, like this moon glow 
uh, Juniper, which is a, a great option uh, as well. Now, most of us are familiar with different hollies. We prefer our native hollies to some of the other hollies we see on the nursery trade. Um, there's the, the standard Yopon holly, which is more of a, a small tree. There's also our deciduous holly, which is known as uh, possum haw holly that we see on the right which it, the females on it, when they lose their leaves, the berries persist through the winter. They're great for wildlife and just adding interest in the winter months. Um, there are also some, some great natives that, uh, that kind of fill the role in a xeriscape or extremely drought tolerant areas. One that we really like is the new Hesperalo, which is brake lights. In fact, we're having a plant sale Memorial Day weekend where we're going to have these for sale, and it's tax-free day for all uh, all water-saving plants, so we're excited about that. Uh, then there's also Color Guard Yucca, which has beautiful blooms. This is a, a, uh, a cultivar of our native yucca filamentosa, so it has the traditional white blooms that that, that yucca has, Adam's needle yucca but also has variegations in the leaves which provide year-round interest. In fact, they're even showier in the winter. You tend to see more reds there. And then another one of my favorites is uh, the Santa Rita Apuntia, or it's a prickly pear. Uh, this is one of the, the uh, more cold-hardy versions, but it has purple, especially in the cooler months and its, and its leaves. And I've got a few of these planted around my landscape, and, and they did quite well despite the freeze. There's also, um, this one's native to uh, North northern Mexico, so not quite in Texas, but about, you know, 100 miles from the Texas border. This one's called Center Stripe, Stripe Agave, and it's extremely cold hardy down to 5 or 10 degrees, but um, really functions well with a lot of our natives and has very interesting variegations on the center of those leaves. Now, I mentioned the hollies before, but there's also shrub versions of, of hollies. Um, there's a weeping holly, which again is, is a cultivar of our native. The scarlet's peak, which has kind of the more upright form. And then there's the micron, which has the more compact form with smaller leaves. It only gets about two feet by two feet. So these are cultivars or nativars of our native species, but really have completely different roles and functions in the landscape. So the weeping is really interesting. Weeping forms, you know, they're, they're not always sad, um, but sometimes they invoke kind of this more melancholy feel or like a relaxing feel in the landscape. They also serve really well as specimens. So it's something like if you turn around a corner, you look out a window, um, walk out a back door, it's really like a focal point. The Scarlet's Peak really work well in the same areas like a screen or if you need some vertical height. And the Micron Holly, like if you, you're you trying to get rid of maybe some boxwoods or other just, you know, plants that are less adapted for our area, you know, maybe Indian Hawthorns. This is a great evergreen, uh, which really works as a backdrop or mid plant um, for, for a lot of our others. Now, grasses uh, do a fantastic at adding texture, form, and color in the landscape. And there's a lot of natives that really do a great job of that. Uh, some of my favorites are the muley grasses, like the gulf muley, white cloud, and pine muley. These are all native grasses that are highly ornamental, used all throughout the nursery trade, and are just fantastic at adding movement and contrast of color and texture. Uh, there's also some shorter grasses like the blue grandma. This one's blonde ambition um, and uh, just great kind of adding interest with its little flags or eyebrows, which are bright yellow. We also have little blue stems like this little munchkin on the center of the screen that add contrast and color and texture and movement. Then we have larger native grasses like the Dallas blues, which has a thicker kind of dark blue uh, leaf to it, uh, adds vertical height. Anywhere you would use pampas grass, this is a good grass that would grow in there. And then it also kind of turns red, some of these, uh, th as we start to get cooler weather. So I think of the native grasses as, as semi-evergreen because they're going to look fantastic for, you know, 10, 11 months out of the year. And then once they kind of start to, to wilt over, look a little bit tattered, then we cut those back kind of in, in mid-February and they start to regrow. 
Now, the salvias or the true sages are uh, natives that we love. Um, there's a selection of our, our native salvia farinacea called Henry Duhlberg, uh, mealy blue sage, which is pictured on the left. Uh, our native salvia gregii, there's a selection like the coral uh, that is featured there on the right. These are fantastic bloomers. Um, the autumn sage is actually semi evergreen. And then we have a hybrid between um, that autumn sage and a, a um, Mexican sage that's native to Mexico uh, that's well adapted called hot lips. Um, and it's got some really neat variegations uh, in or bicolor in, in the, the, uh, the flowers themselves. And that sometimes are a little bit more white, sometimes they're a little bit more blue. I mean, red, sorry, depending on the color. Uh, there's also a true salvia gregii that they've bred that has that bicolor feature as well if you're looking for something ornamental. Now, a, a lot of people um, have a love-hate relationship with this plant, but it is one of my favorites for extremely low light conditions. If you have an area that's bare soil and nothing else will grow and maybe you have flooding problems because you know you don't have gutters or your neighbors don't have gutters or sending water, um, but this one is great. This is a cultivar of lyre leaf sage called Purple Volcano, but they have beautiful uh, blue, kind of light blue, white blooms, and then contrasting uh, purple foliage. So if you want to kind of keep these uh, in an area, you can deadhead them. And actually, once they're, they're done blooming, you can cut them off um, and kind of discard the, the uh, seed heads. Um, but they're really great at forming ground covers. So uh, ground covers on a slope, shady area. Um, I really, really love this plant. Now, the other name for this plant is cancer weed, and it's not because, because it treats any medical condition. It is because it tends to be a little bit aggressive. Um, and so if you want to kind of keep it in check, either either remove the seed heads or maybe you can use some kind of pre-emergent to keep those seeds from germinating but it's kind of like a juga where it can it can reseed texas gold columbine is a great way to add color in shadier spots mine looks amazing right now it's got these huge kind of spurs on the flowers um, and this does good in in uh part sun to full shade spots Softleaf yucca or yucca re recurvifolia. Uh, these actually uh, really add a lot of function and their spines tend to kind of fold over. So they're not going to stab you in the leg or anything like that. So in fact, I have some not too far from a swing in my backyard and love their blooms in the summer. Um, but really nice at adding that contrast and structure. Um, but do well in full sun to kind of park shade areas. Dwarf palmetto, if you're looking for that structure contrast and you don't want the spines, uh, they do a great job in full sun to full shade spots. Uh, they're great around pools, great underneath trees, have great berries that birds will use and other wildlife, but that just added a nice tropical feel. Greg's Mist Flower is one. If you're looking to attract butterflies and different pollinators, one of the best perennial natives that you can find. Um, it has these powdery blooms, which are starting to bloom now, and they'll persist into the fall. We'll get to see monarchs enjoying them, uh, as well as uh, a bunch of other uh, native um, butterflies, uh, like the queens that are pictured here. Carolina cherry laurel, if you're looking for an evergreen screen, kind of a small tree, large shrub, uh, they have great delicate blooms in the spring, and those will give rise to a uh, small little berry that many uh, birds will utilize. But just this kind of really nice um, Christmas tree kind of form in the, in the compact cultivars that thrive in full sun to full shade spots. Now, uh, one of my favorite natives for full sun areas that get well-draining soil in terms of an ornamental tree is the desert willow. And it has these big orchid, almost like flowers, um, that bloom all summer long, really can withstand west uh, exposure, a lot of heat, um, just super, super great ornamental trees. Uh, this has Texas mountain laurel. Clearly, it's not that. This is uh, a couple of our native, um, a... Uh, Turks caps 
So we have the larger uh, turkey cap, which does better in kind of the southern areas. And then we have uh, the traditional turkey cap, which comes in whites and pinks and reds. These do great in shady corners where not a lot wants to grow, um, but are extremely tough natives for lower light conditions, but can still handle sun. I love Texas sages. Uh, it's a great evergreen shrub, grows from uh, full sun to part sun, needs good draining soil. Um, We've got uh, White Cloud is the white blooming cultivar. There's Silverado and uh, Green Cloud that uh, has kind of green leaves. But um, after every heavy event, rainfall event in the summer, you'll see them just covered in these lavender to blue to, to white colored blooms. Now, Texas Mountain Laurel, this actually is a Texas Mountain Laurel, uh, is a great evergreen shrub that adds color in the spring intoxicating grape-like smell, but evergreen foliage, which is kind of round and adds contrast in, in terms of foliage, but is, is can be trimmed to kind of a small tree, but works well as a shrub for full sun to part shade spots. Texas sage is a nice sub shrub. Uh, so um, it is a hibiscus. So you have these kind of nice smaller hibiscus-like flowers grows in full sun to part shade and uh, blooms for most of the growing season. Uh, and in fact, this one was just named a Texas superstar, uh, but just super tough plant. Love, love, love this one. Um, there's Texas Mountain Laurel. Again, you can see so I got my slides mixed up. Uh, dwarf Wax Myrtle. So Dwarf Wax Myrtle um, could be a, a larger shrub to smaller tree. Uh, it does well in low light conditions, full shade to full sun. It can be trimmed up if you want it to have more of that tree form, or you can have it that more shrubby form. It's evergreen, so provides year-round interest. It works in, in a variety of light conditions. has really pretty berries in the fall. Um, and then uh, it's also edible if you can use this one as a substitute for bay leaf. So you just kind of use it as a spice and... Uh, the leaves are historically been used in crab boils. In fact, uh, one of the major crab boil uh, kind of mixes on the market uses wax myrtle as an ingredient. American beautyberry. If you're looking for a shrub that really adds a lot of fall interest as with these long arching branches, these will thrive in full shade conditions. It's native to our area. The berries provide food for wildlife and uh, just very, very ornamental and kind of persist until the fall and the winter. This is flame acanthus. It is a shrub, deciduous shrub, so it loses its leaves and kind of dies back, but it grows very vigorous every year. The other name for this one is hummingbird bush for its propensity to attract hummingbirds to the landscape with its deeply throated uh, red flowers that bloom all throughout the summer. Gara, as I have some three Gara planted in my in my front yard. This is these are cultivars of Gara uh, Lindheimer's Gara Gara Lindheimeri, but it's uh, come in pinks and whites. Um, a great job of attracting pollinators and kind of these long arching flower stems that dance in the wind. They almost look like butterflies, kind of whirling throughout the landscape. If you're looking for something that blooms in the fall. This is a great one. Fall aster, we're going to have this one uh, on a sale at our plant sale as well as most of the plants I'm talking about. Um, but these are ones sometimes are harder to find and come, you know, November and December when a lot of stuff isn't blooming, these are just completely covered in blooms uh, are amazing. In fact, so many times neighbors will stop and be like, what is this plant? What is this plant? Um, just because you don't notice it for most of the year. And it has semi-evergreen foliage, so it actually provides a year-round interest. And then especially in the fall, it's just amazing with the purple blooms with, with uh, yellow centers. Another great one is Echinacea, also known as purple coneflower. It's a perennial, great for pollinators. Most people are familiar with this plant. Thrives in full sun to part shade. Uh, just a, amazing blooms. Some of the most amazing blooms in the landscape. Rudbeckia also look very similar to them. They're also a cone flower, um, but instead of uh, the purple leaves, they have the yellow, and they really play well. Um, you know, 
sometimes the echinaceas will come up and the rudbeckias will come up a little bit after, but there's some time where you'll see them blooming together and really the purples and the yellows go great in the garden together. Blackfoot daisy, I mentioned this plant does well in well-draining soil, the west full sun spots. Maybe it's a spot that's just so hot and dry and nothing else wants to grow. That is the perfect place for this plant. It loves spilling over rocks or, you know, with gravel and rock mulches, but it does need well-draining soil. One of our native skull caps, these are great border plants for full sun areas, a very dense, long bloomers, great for pollinators. Um, you see it combined here with the Blackfoot Daisy uh, with those kind of white, yellow, and purple combination. But needs full sun, but just a great bloomer for, for those hot spots. If you're looking for a native vine, uh, my colleague Patrick and I were recommending this one yesterday. Uh, these look amazing right now, bloom in the spring, and sometimes you'll get more blooms throughout the growing season. Uh, great for bees and butterflies and hummingbirds. Uh, not aggressive like its, its cousin, the trumpet vine, but just so, so neat with the orange blooms and the yellow centers. <coughs> Excuse me, this is a, a native that is used all throughout, you know, traditional landscapes as well. If you're looking for another native vine that comes in either yellows or, or reds, this is the coral honeysuckle which also blooms in the spring and is uh, amazing and kind of full sun to part shade areas. A lot of times they, they kind of bloom on the edges where trees and more open landscapes meet together. Uh, again, a favorite of hummingbirds if you're looking to attract those. Now, this is a good ground cover. It gets, it looks like rosemary, but it's a Texas native called snake herb. It has kind of those, the, the feel and, and look with the purple blooms as rosemary. Uh, but it's a ground cover for full sun to part shade spots and is a long bloomer, so you get those blooms uh, kind of throughout the growing season. Another great ground cover plant that's a native is the frog fruit. And again, if you have spots that nothing else wants to grow, if you maybe turf grass doesn't want to grow and you have bare soil or you have um, a spot that's too hot or too dry or too wet or too shady, frog fruit will grow. It's got these small little verbena-like flowers. Um, um, it can vigorously spread through, you know, you know maybe it's you have like paved stone or, or kind of flagstone throughout. Um, just really good at stabilizing areas and soil that would normally be a muddy mess. I love, love, love that plant. There's another plant worth mentioning. This one is not a, 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 a Texas native. It is native to one county the furthest county west in, in Louisiana. So, you know, it's native almost to, to Texas, but not quite a North American native. Um, but uh, this hydrangeas typically use a lot of water. And this one, once established, is extremely drought tolerant. I rarely water my oak leaf hydrangeas. They thrive in shady spots, which tend to hold water longer and can do well in the heavier soils in those spots. Um, but they will bloom kind of late spring, summer, in the fall, the blooms will persist and kind of dry on there um, and look amazing in the fall as well. They did last year. Uh, they're also great for many of our native pollinators. So you'll just see bees all over them. Uh, and then they're semi-evergreen. They have uh, reds in the, the big kind of uh, oak-like foliage and those will persist until we get really cold snaps and they tend to drop off. So I would say 50% of the time, this is what they're going to look like in December. And if we have a really hard freeze, kind of late December, January, they'll start to drop there. So semi-evergreen that they provide uh, interest most of the year. You can also incorporate a native uh, seed mixes and different pocket prairies and micro meadows using a variety of our wildflowers and so that may something be something you want to do on your landscape as well some of these are perennials and some of them are annuals but they really add a lot of interest and benefit uh, not only to our ecosystem but but also um, our ornamental to look at i wanted to kind of go through quickly 
um, some of my favorite combinations of different native plants in the landscape. So when you're grouping natives together, you still want to pay attention to the ornamental design principles that we talked about or open with. We want to make sure that they function well together, right? So make sure they have similar sunlight needs, similar water needs, the same soil and nutrient needs and, and different tolerance. So we wouldn't plant a native plant that's better ad adapted to acidic soil next to one that really likes alkaline soil because then you couldn't amend both of those to make both those plants happy. If you had a drought tolerant plant next to a plant uh, that could handle wet feet, then one of those plants may not be happy, right? If I put oak leaf hydrangea next to blackfoot daisy, one of those plants is not going to be happy. So it's good that we group them in areas where, where they'll tend to play nice together. Now, this combination is a mixed combination of or the Ruby Falls Redbud that, that I mentioned. Uh, I also have the Four Nerve Daisy in here, which I absolutely love. It's blooming right now, uh, just completely co covered with blooms. And you see the contrast between the purple and the yellows really make each plant pop. The Color Guard Yuccas on the bottom, which now they're blooming, just look amazing, but have that variegated leaf shape. It's kind of more structural, and so that contrasts with the the kind of more uh, large broad foliage of the, the ruby falls as well as the more airy foliage that we see with the grasses this one is blue grandma grass um, and uh, just a super super cool ornamental grass low growing but all these plants planted together they have contrast and colors and textures and have similar uh, requirements so you may want to consider combining those in the same area if you're looking for a shade combination this is a great one uh, with the palmetto that we talked about earlier which kind of grows in the form of a shrub but is a shrubby palm with those big fronds and those big fronds contrast really nice with the pink turks cap with the larger leaves on the oak leaf hydrangea the whites of the blooms go well with the pink blooms on a pink Turk's cat. And then you have the rising sun red bud, which brings in some of the pink in the leaves and, and uh, you know, add some contrast with the yellows there. But that's a pairing of native plants that, that work really well in lower light conditions. I mentioned uh, the, the purple prickly pear, but you could mix that with like some of our agaves, like a whale's tongue agave and other cold hardy native agaves, and then some of the hedgehog cacti. Uh, so you see kind of some of the pinks and the foliage and the flowers and the yellows and the, the flowers that kind of tie in together and contrast with the gray leaf and the purple pink leaf and kind of the more yellow leaf, but pairing those together and maybe a real sunny spot that gets good drainage would, would look really nice. There's some, some other natives that could be paired together for a screen. Uh, the Wichita Blue Juniper is another native juniper uh, that is more compact and has that gray-green foliage, and that would go really great in front of uh, some of our dwarf uh, magnolias, which are better adapted. So this is Magnolia grandiflora, which is native to East Texas, but this cultivar does better in Dallas, too. Um, so it's more adapted to our alkaline soil. It's less, uh, like, kind of shrubby it's it's more compact it doesn't get as big uh, so more columnar look and all these plants are evergreen and then paired with the uh, compact cherry laurel which has those white blooms and the fruits uh, so you have blooms and and fruits and evergreens um, that would provide kind of a year-round screen for maybe a noisy street or a nosy neighbor or or any kind of uh, situation you wanted to block out have you want some hot summer blooms uh, the mealy blue sage is incredible with planted with some of our native coreopsis so you have the the kind of blue purples and the yellows together and then i mixed in some blackfoot daisy here so that's a low growing plant that would grow in front of the coreopsis so you have those layers and then the white and the purple and the white and the gold really go nice together and then mixing in some mexican feather grass throughout to add movement and textural contrast. Another great native combo uh, that my colleague Patrick loves is the red salvia gregii or autumn sage paired with the purple coneflower. A lot of times you don't really think of coneflowers having reds in them, but on the color wheel, our coneflower, the purple is, is kind of close to the reds and the orange is on the other side of the red. So it's got oranges and purples, 
and the red's kind of the middle color there, and then mixing that with something contrasting like uh, the Rudbeckia is really nice, so you have long blooms kind of throughout the, the growing season. If you're looking for year-round planting in the sun, you can mix the little blue stems together with the Coreopsis, the Flamencanthus, uh, the Dwarf Wax Myrtle, and so you have evergreens paired with long bloomers, the reds uh, of the Flamencanthus with the center reds of the Coreopsis, and the reds that we see in the fall with the little blue stem. So all native plants paired together that really have a lot of ornamental value. Another one that I like, I love the combination of purples and yellows together. My native uh, golden yarrow is looking amazing right now. With kind of the lacy foliage, uh, kind of gray green. We've also got yellow hesperalo, which I apologize, I spelled wrong there. It ends with an E. Um, and then uh, there's a purple autumn sage or salvia gregii, so a native R. Um, that works really well with those. And then we have Texas sage mixed in there too. So you have different contrast in the foliage. You have some gray greens and some darker greens. And then you have evergreens that are the, the Texas sage and the Hesperalo. So um, that provides year round interest. Another great compo that looks great after a summer rain or uh, the spring or summer rain are the echinacea mixed with the sun drops or the callilophus on the bottom right. I uh, have the Lynn's Legacy or Lowry's Legacy Texas Sage, technically not native to, to Texas, native to northern Mexico, um, but, you know, the, 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 they're very well adapted here. The plants don't know if the line is you know, 50 miles south of Mexico or 50 miles north of Mexico where they grow, uh, but but definitely a native to our eco region. And this is a great combination of the purples and the, and the yellows together. If you're looking for another native combo for the shade, I love the Columbine mixed with the uh, American Beauty Berry mixed with the Yopon Holly for evergreen interest. Uh, mixed with the inland sea oats, so that's what we call a semi-evergreen. It's got these nice oat seed heads that are kind of dancing in the wind just right outside my window uh, here. And then I've got um, also the lyre leaf sage planted there. And this is a planting that I have in my own backyard, but love this combination together. And this will thrive in full shade to dense shade. So if you have that spot where nothing else will grow, like I have shade, I can't get anything to grow, these natives will thrive in that spot. If you're looking for some cool native blooms, uh, we've got Texas Mount Laurel, which blooms in the spring, has that evergreen foliage. We've got Texas Rock Rose, which has a long blooming season with those small native hibiscus-like flowers. I love the combo of the, the uh, Texas Rock Rose and the Greg's Mist Flower. I have that together in my own yard, but they're kind of opposite on the color wheels. So you have the powdery blue and kind of the salmon pinks. Uh, and then I also mixed in some pink skull cap. Now, um, I know the purple skull cap is native to our area. I believe this is one is, a, is another uh, um, North American native, but not a Texas native. Uh, but it was really great low grower, and you're mixing pinks and purples together if you like uh, that color combo. Now, that is all that I had uh, for this morning in terms of slides, but I hope that gives you um, maybe some information and as well as some inspiration about how you can use native plants in the landscape for the benefit of, you know, reducing our water use, protecting our stormwater, providing habitat and food for wildlife, but at the same time creating an ornamental landscape that you can enjoy and you're going to spend less time maintaining that landscape uh, at the same time. Now, if we have any questions, um, I would love 